So I just want to just brag on these guys for a minute. I have just been so blessed and honored to get to see the growth the Father has brought about in these two. Um, as long as I've known them, but especially over this last year. So, you know, when we see growth, we need to take advantage of it. So here, pray. <laughs> you help me now? Well, I'd like to thank everybody for uh, coming back. I hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. Um, I just pray that, uh, like I said, again, um, everybody online, I hope everybody had a good Thanksgiving. So let's, uh, if everybody would stand so we could pray. Father, we just thank you for your Shabbat, Father, and I just pray that uh, you would just come into this house today, Father. I pray you pour out your Ruach upon this place. I pray that you would just bring your anointing like only you can, Father. I pray you would touch every head that's, a, that's represented here, Father. I pray that you would just touch everyone online in a way that only you can, Father God. And I pray that you would just, again, just touch your day and thank you for allowing us to set your part, your day apart, Father. In your name we pray. Amen.
faccio, faccio, faccio no. Shabbat, 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 I need to hear more clapping than that. Y'all are weak this morning, come on. Let's start that again. I know your bellies are still full, and that turkey makes you want to go to sleep. But I need your help. All right, let's try that again. Behold how good and how pleasant. There you go. For brothers to dwell together.
Good morning. Blow your toe, break your toe. Everybody did all right? Sleepy? Hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. We did at the Cloud House.
let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, is my song. And let the king of my heart be the shadow.
Yeah. 
idols and lied about it, people who cheated, schemed, murdered, all of these people are in the lineage of the Messiah. 
And so I started thinking about me. I am descended from people who consorted with married women, had illegitimate children by them, from those who consorted with other men and had illegitimate children, and people who indulged in other vile practices and things that I won't even mention. And for all I know, there might even be a murderer or two in my lineage. That's where I came from. And I'm sure that if you thought back about where you come from, most of you anyway, would probably start thinking, wow, that's pretty rough stuff. But I stand here today grateful and thankful that the Messiah was able to look beyond where I come from and put me on the path where he wanted me to go, as it is with every one of us in this room. So we do not glorify those things that are vile and wicked and evil and just, you know, are the most base uh, conditions of mankind. But we glorify our Father who through His Son has plucked us out of that, snatched us out of that, and He's placed us here. He's placed us here for this time in this season, and through Him we are forgiven. And not only that, I believe that when we renounce the sins of our fathers, that all of those bonds and all of those, those things would encumber us and bind us to that, He breaks that. He dissolves that, because that's not who we are anymore, you know. I, 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 go ahead, yes, go ahead. <laughs> Beth and I were both raised in South Georgia. You know, we grew up on grits and greens and all those kinds of things. And I know some of you share that cultural background, and some of you are Yankees, and you have that, you know, but... You know, but when we were born again, we became a new creation. Our heritage is not where we came from. Our heritage is with the house of David, all right? And we should all be grateful for that. I know we're thankful for all that he's taught us, and I know we're grateful for all he's allowed us to come to understand that we didn't understand before, and all that is well and good, and it's great, and it's wonderful, but let's never lose sight of the fact that, well, let's put it this way, don't rejoice that the devils obey you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen. So Father, we are grateful to you. We're thankful. We're thankful today that in spite of our past, in spite of our ancestry of the flesh, that you have absolved us from our sins. You have forgiven us. You have wiped the penalty away because it was placed upon the shoulders of your son, Yeshua, our Messiah, our Redeemer, and our King. And more than all of the gifts that this world has to offer, we thank you of, for that gift, that we can be reconciled back to you through the Son, and that we would be called your sons and daughters. We thank you for this privilege, this honor. And Father, help us as sons and daughters of the Most High, to live our lives in a responsible way that says, yes, we do belong to you, that you are our God and there is no other. So Father, may your peace that surpasses all understanding settle upon us today because we know that in Messiah, our names are written in heaven and we thank you for that today. Amen. Amen. Let's just continue to stand. And let's recite the Bishamru together. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily, my Sabbaths you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord that doth sanctify you. 
Wherefore, the children of Israel, next slide, please, so everybody can say it with me. There we go. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. In Mark chapter 12, it says that one of the scribes came, and having heard them reasoning together, perceiving that he'd answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? And Yeshua answered him, the most important of all the commandments is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the first commandment. And the second like it is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Gentlemen. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Baruch Shem Kavod Malchuto Leolam Vahe Ladies Shema Israel Adonai Somebody say hello while we get the hoopah ready. 
Make sure you welcome our visitors here today. For those of you watching at home, this is a lot more difficult than it would seem. <laughs> it's easier said than done. <laughs> if you are at home and your children are close by, won't you go ahead and gather them together? Mr. Director, can I see the other side? There we go. There they are. So now if we could get all of our smallest, our little itty bitties to come up under the hoopah, moms and dads, if you need to come with them, come on. So let's get all of our smallest, or come on, come on. Let's get all of our sons and daughters gathered under the hoopah, please. Let's get all the boys and girls out here. Gather on in, squeeze on in. Mr. Director, let me see on the other side again. I'm just curious about something here. No, y'all are packed over there too. So I'm thinking we got most. So if everyone that can will stand, please. And those of you who are at home, gather your children close to you. Our treasure box is here. So that includes all the photographs of your loved ones, those that can't be with us. And so as we always try to point out, that our Father is able of watching over those here and those who aren't those of our children and grandchildren that we don't know where they're at right now we don't know what they're doing but he does and so we pray this blessing over them as well so let's extend our hands to these may the lord protect and defend you may the lord preserve you from shame and may you come to be in israel shining name and may you be like Ruth and like David may you be deserving of praise 
strengthen them, O oh Lord, and keep them from the stranger's ways. And may God bless you and grant you long lives. May sons and daughters, our grandchildren, some great-grandchildren. And Father, we pray that you do keep your hand upon them to cover them, to go with them wherever they go. And I pray, Father, that all the gifts and talents that you've already created within them, Father, that they would be all, always be in an environment that would foster those gifts and talents to be used to advance your purpose and kingdom. I pray, Father, for their yet to be revealed spouses of the future. We'll even go ahead and pray for them that you'll keep your hand upon them to raise them up to fear you and to serve you. For all of our sons and daughters that are here with us, those that are far off, keep your hand upon them. Alert them, Father, in a way that they can understand whatever age they may be. Alert to them to what is going on around them, to be aware of what is going on around them. And, and those who have allowed the world to suck them in, to come to the realization that they have, they have fallen into a snare, that without your help, they will not be able to escape. But we believe that you keep your hand upon your children. We, we believe that these that we've dedicated to you, that we have sought your face on their behalf for, we believe, Father, that you will keep them, that you will guard them, that you will deliver them, that you will save them. And Father, that you will, for those who have gone away, we pray again that you'll make their lives miserable until they see your truth, until they come to their senses and they say within themselves, what was I thinking? The servants in my father's house have it better than this. I will go back to my father's house and may it be in their heart to return to you first, to, to your ways first, before they return to family, that they would return to you with all of their heart and all of their being. And for these, Father, that are still growing up, Father, surround them with men and women, parents and grandparents that will continually set your word before them and live it before them in a way that is conducive to life and emulation and that in all things that you would be honored and that your great name would be sanctified in us and through us and our children. And we pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. You may be seated. You can return to your place. That is all except Naomi Hood. You need to come up here on the stage.
Naomi turned 12 this past week. And, and so an acknowledgement that she's turned 12, she's now in her 13th year, she um, kind of acknowledged or prepared for her bat mitzvah. She wanted to recite some scripture for us today. So I was asked, would it be okay if a 12-year-old young lady comes and recites scripture before the congregation? And I said, sure. You know. <laughs> So you've re, you've re, re, you're you going to recite some verses from this Torah portion, correct? All right. Here you go. Genesis 37, 1 through 11. Yaakov continued living in the land where his father had lived as a foreigner, the land of Canaan. Here is the history of Yaakov. When Yosef was 17 years old, he used to pasture the flock with his brothers, even though he was still a boy. Once, when he was with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, he brought a bad report about them to their father. Now Israel loved Yosef the most of all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a long-sleeved robe. When his brothers saw that their father loved him the, more than all his brothers, he brought, he, they began to hate him and reached the point where they couldn't even talk with him in a civil manner. Yosef had a dream which he told to his brothers, and it made them hate him all the more. He said to them, Listen while I tell you about this dream of mine. We were tying up bundles of wheat in the field when suddenly my bundle got up by itself and stood upright. Then your bundles came, gathered around mine, and prostrated themselves before it. His brothers retorted, Yes, you will certainly be our king. You will do a great job of bossing us around. And they hated him still more for his dreams and what he said. He had another dream which he told to his brothers. Here, I had another dream, and there were the sun, the moon, and eleven stars prostrating themselves before me. He told his father too, as well as his brothers, and, but his father rebuked him. What is this dream you have had? Do you really expect me, your mother, and your brothers to come and prostrate ourselves before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Genesis 37, 1 through 11. When she stood up here right before, she said, I'm so nervous. But she did a great job, didn't she? Amen. So maybe we should make that a requirement, parents, <laughs> that they have to memorize some scripture that they can. I, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know. You turn a certain age, you have to get up in front of people and say scripture and stuff like that. I don't know. It sounds like a good idea. I wonder if everyone's ever thought of it before. Anyway. All right. <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Naomi. Shabbat shalom, everyone. Hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving. Four of you did. Okay, good. No, uh, we had a we had a very good Thanksgiving, and um, I understand we had a pretty good crowd over here on Thursday. Is that right? Seventy plus. Great. That's great. So, how many of you are ready to go out for a hamburger after sundown? <laughs> okay, anyway, I guess that was a bad joke. That was a dad joke, right? Thank you. Thank you. All right, Bethany, if you will hand me that iPad. Or have that gentleman right next to you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Again, is everyone doing well today? couple of announcements I want to make real quick. <laughs> I'm sorry. She was, I thought she might do something cute, so I, wanted, I didn't want to miss it. A uh, couple of announcements I want to make. Of course, um, today, if you remember, after service, we are dismissed. Uh, we're not doing Oneg today, and we're not doing a Midrash, because I know that Many of you have family in town, friends in town. You want to spend some time with them. So we had decided that we wouldn't have anything after the service. If you didn't remember, 
Oh, well. <laughs> Surprise. Um, and, uh, but anyway, yeah, we're going to be dismissed after the service today so that everybody can go and spend some time with your family and your friends and just enjoy this, this time together and continue to be in the spirit of thanksgiving, you know, th being thankful for our family at thanksgiving. <laughs> I'll say it again. And be thankful for our family at thanksgiving, right? All right. Uh, secondly, this week, of course, we're uh, gearing up for Hanukkah. Hanukkah begins tomorrow evening, uh, first night of Hanukkah. Isn't that right? Yes. Okay. I thought somebody said, no, oh, anyway. So the first night of Hanukkah begins tomorrow night. And so this week we will not have a Wednesday night service, um, but we are going to begin our Hanukkah celebration next era of Shabbat next Friday over at the OCI building. That means plenty of parking, plenty of seats, plenty of places to put your feet when you're dancing around. So we'll be over there starting to, uh, Friday night um, at 7 p.m. Is that right, Laura? Thank you. And then we'll have our regular Shabbat service next week, uh, next weekend over there. We'll start at 11 a.m. Halissa Elwine will be here, and she's going to be sharing with us during the, the Torah service, the Shabbat service. And then we'll meet again Saturday evening. And by the way, Saturday evening is also um, Rosh Chodesh. So we will be kind of integrating our Rosh Chodesh service into our Hanukkah celebration. And then, of course, Sunday morning, Paul Wilbur will be here. Uh, and he, he's going to lead us in praise and worship. And I just learned yesterday, was it yesterday? Yes that his wife will be joining us, and Victor, the, his accompanying us, his wife and child will be joining us. So, um, yeah, so I'm going to have to scramble to take care of a few things. But anyway, we're looking forward to having a good time. So if you have not yet registered for that, go do so now. It doesn't cost you anything, but we just need to have an idea of how many people we should expect with chairs and things like that. What are we up to now, somebody? 730? Over? Okay. So over 730 people have signed up to come. Uh, you don't have to sign up to come. It would just be helpful to us to kind of give us an idea. So we're about 730 people, so sounds like it ought to be a good time. So everybody bring their, their excitement, their energy, their good attitude. Leave all your junk behind, okay? All right, so is there anything else we need to announce, seeing that we won't be back here for Midrash or anything? No? All right, so let's go to our Torah portion. Father, first of all, I want to thank you again for this day that you have set apart, that you have blessed, that you've given to your people to be a time to push the pause button on life and all of the distress and challenges and aggravation, and yes, the, even the victories. But you've given us this time to pause on all of those things that we can dedicate ourselves to resting in you, to abiding in you, to, to feeling, to know your peace and uh, your presence. And so we ask, Father, that as we go to your word, that you'll help us to, to better understand how your word speaks to us today and what it has to say to us as individuals, not just as a, an assembly, but as individuals as well. And I pray, Father, that you give me a clear mind, clarity of mind to say the things that you would have me to say and that your spirit would give life and power and unction to the words that are spoken. Those words that you wish to resonate within your people today. And all these things we pray and ask, we believe you for in Yeshua's name. Amen. All right, so Genesis chapter 37, beginning at verse 1. I'm going to have to read it because I can't memorize it like Naomi. Now Jacob dwelt, and that is Vayeshev, Vayeshev. He dwelt in the land where his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. And this is the history of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brothers, and the lad was with, son, with the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to his father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all of his children, because he was the son of his old age. And also he made him a tunic of many colors, but when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. 
So even though it says that this is the history of Jacob, really it's going to focus and emphasize Joseph more so than anything else, or uh, anyone else, I should say, because Joseph, as we know, is the man who is destined to lead this family that's called Israel. And as this portion begins, even though he is a very young man, he is described, or it's hinted at it, at least, that he's very spiritually sensitive because he has these dreams. He understands that these dreams have something to say. It's important, prophetic. And, and so he, he discerns that. But he might be just a little bit indiscreet as well, being young, because he goes out and he tells them to these brothers that he's already given a bad report to his father about. So to kind of you know, add insult to injury, let me tell you about this dream where you bowed down to me. Isn't that great? Now, how many of us would like for somebody to come to us and say, I had a dream where you're going to bow down to me? Yeah, we'd take that really well, wouldn't we? Well, that's what's going on. So he was very spiritually sensitive, obviously. He's still young, as I said, maybe indiscreet. And this Torah portion also describes Joseph as being a handsome man. He was handsome in form and in appearance. And just out of curiosity, I looked the Hebrew words up to see, you know, is there some hidden meaning here? Mm, no, pretty much what it says is that he had a nice body and he was pretty good to look at. You know, if you're interested in that kind of thing. <laughs> and yet, maybe there is something more to it. Some people see in that statement that he was fair to look upon, that he had a good form and appearance, is that there was something about him that if you too were spiritually sensitive, you would have been able to discern. Because it's suggesting that his character was showing through. And not just his character, but his destiny. Have you ever met someone that you didn't really know them, but there was just something about them that just distinguished them from a lot of other folks? Maybe not. I have. There was just an air about them. And sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not so good. But in this particular case, the hint is that people could discern that Joseph was different. Joseph was special, not just his physical appearance, but the way he presented himself, even as a young man. And so then, if that is the case, then perhaps that contributed to the jealousy that his brothers had for him. Perhaps they discerned that there's something different about this guy. I want to go ahead and jump ahead um, and to kind of make my point. Even the people who despised Yeshua knew there was something about him, right? They knew there was something about it. This man teaches with authority. They discerned this, even though they were jealous of him and could not speak peaceably to him. And so you see where I'm going with that. So then you couple that with he's delivered a bad report about them. I've got these dreams where you're all bowing down to me. And so we understand that they could not think of him in the right way. Now Joseph had a dream, verse 5. And he told it to his brothers, and they hated him even more. And so he said to them, Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. And there we were, binding sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. Indeed, your sheaves stood all around and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Shall you indeed reign over us? Or shall you indeed have dominion over us? And so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed still another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Look, I've dreamed another dream. And this time the sun, the moon, the eleven stars bowed down to me. And so he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. So he, he has a different dream with the same message. And so the dream is doubled, and so it should be obvious to anyone with any spiritual discernment that this is something that God is saying to and through this young man. And that caused their hatred to become jealousy and envy, and there's all these different, different things going on. Because apparently they found it difficult to consent to be ruled over by someone who was younger. Um, they found it difficult to concede to the fact that his spiritual um, position, I don't know if that's the right word or not, or status, was in some ways superior to those. 
And besides, he was the son of Leah. Or he was not the son of Leah. He was the son of Leah's rival. So all of that is to say it was very clear that even though these things were from God, his brothers were not ready to hear what he had to say. And I've, I've shared this with you from time to time, but I want to point it out again. Just because God tells you something doesn't mean everybody else wants to hear about it. It's really important not only to know the truth, but to be able to discern when the right time is to share that truth with people. So, you know, I know that all of us, probably anyway, when we have learned something new, and especially when we learn, oh, the Sabbath's for everybody, all of God's people, these feast days are for all, oh, we shouldn't be eating that, and all these kinds of things, we just could not keep our mouths shut, could we? We had to run out and tell everybody about it. And how did everybody react to it? Right? You were sold into slavery and went to, Ish, uh, to uh, Egypt right now. All right, so you can't convince someone of something they're not ready to be convinced of is the point. So it is equally important, along with wisdom, to have discretion. To know. To know who you're speaking to. By the way, I'm going to go ahead and say this. Um, when we, as a congregation, visit someone else's facility, and maybe they don't see things exactly the same way we do, you know what we're not going to do? We're not going to disrespect them in their facility. Right? We're going to be respectful. Okay, because we're going to be discreet, and we're going to realize that not everybody sees things just the way we see them, right? And not everybody is ready to hear everything, everything I've got to say. Agreed? So we're going to be wise, and we're going to be discerning, and we're going to be respectful and discreet. And I say that not because anyone's done anything. I'm just saying that just kind of planting the seed for the future, and now you're all going to go home and say, what did he mean by this? <laughs> well, go and learn. Never mind. All right. <laughs> so all of this here has set the stage for another story. And that's what we were really focused on today. And it's not so much the story of Joseph as much as it, as it is the story of Judah and what happens to him and all the things that um, uh, he exhibited in this tour portion. By the way, he is the one who convinced the others to sell Joseph into slavery. Genesis chapter 37, verse 26, Judah is speaking. He says, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. And then later, it is also, at least according to tradition, Judah, who along with his other brothers, presented the bloody tunic of Joseph to Jacob and said in verse 32, We have found this. Do you know whether it is your son's tunic or not? And that's very important because of something that comes out later in this Torah portion. Is this your son's? Do you recognize this? And Jacob replied, it is my son's coat. A beast has devoured him. He's torn him to pieces. Literally what he said is my son's coat. A wild beast has eaten him. Torn, torn is Joseph. And I'm only going to bring this out because of the word in Hebrew that is translated as torn. It's very interesting because there's something just beyond the fact Jacob is lamenting what he believes to be the death of his son. There's something prophetic going on here as well. Joseph, what everything he represents is a prophetic story. I think we all know that and would agree with that. So when he says, torn, torn is Joseph, the root word that is used there in Hebrew is taraf, and it's spelled tet resh Fe, or fesofit, the end form of the uh, final form of that letter. So tet resh fe, taraf. Here's what it means. To tear, to pluck, or to snatch. So he's, Jacob is reacting to this news that apparently my son is dead. Apparently a wild beast has torn him, has torn him to pieces. And this is the terminology he uses. But I'm going to say that more than just a literal reaction, what he is saying has prophetic overtones. Because he is hinting by saying that word twice that Joseph would be torn in ways 
uh, more than just one way. In other words, more than just in a physical way. So to kind of put a finer point on what I'm trying to say, this is the same word, Torah, that is used in a prophecy where Ephraim, who is Joseph's son, says this in Hosea chapter 6. Come and let us return to the Lord. He has torn, but he will heal us. And so Joseph's son, those who have strayed away, those who have gone and done their own thing, they've been scattered all the different nations throughout the world. Finally, one day they come to the realization, hey, what am I doing? Even the servants in my father's house have it better than this. Let's return to our Father's house. Let us return to the Lord. Shuv is that word return. Let's turn back to Him. He has torn, taraf. He has done what it was said was done to Joseph. He has torn us, but He will heal us. He is stricken, but He will bind us up. And the prophecy even goes on to tell us when He is going to heal, when He is going to bind up. After two days, He will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up that we may live in his sight. Just a footnote to that. It was not the first or the second appearance of Joseph's brothers before him that he revealed himself. But it was on the third appearance. Kind of interesting. All right, let me go on. So Hosea chapter 6, tying that to what Jacob has just said. Jacob even then was talking about Joseph being torn, being if implied scattered, being gone. And yet, the prophecy in Hosea 6 says that even though that happened, He is going to restore us. He's going to bind us up. He's going to put us back together. In fact, this is speaking of the restoration that occurs when the two become one. And by the way, this is why Yeshua came, died, and was resurrected. So that those who were the two could become one. He didn't do it according to John chapter 11 just for those who were of the Jews, but for all the children of God who were scattered abroad throughout all these nations to bring us all back and to make us one new man is the way Paul puts it. And so these brothers and all the things that they did and their involvement was um, despicable and yet was serving a purpose. And chief among these was Judah because he was the one who devised the plan to sell him. So then, in this Torah portion, we look at two primary people in God, among God's people, Joseph and Judah. Judah is the ancestor of King David and the Messiah. Joseph has the birthright. And so there's this very, very mysterious parallel that these two are on. And both of them are eventually going to lead us to the Messiah. By the way, you, you probably know that in some sects of Judaism, they do believe in two comings of the Messiah. I'll put it that way. The suffering servant, Mashiach bin Yosef, and then the king, Mashiach bin David. Now, they don't see it the way you and I see it yet. But nevertheless, they do acknowledge that Joseph is a prototype of the Messiah and that David is a prototype of the Messiah as well. And these two personalities are coming from two different lines in some ways, as far as their mothers are concerned, but yet are on a parallel path that eventually converges. And let's put it this way, those two become one. Their involvement summarized in the Messiah. So Judah and Joseph are these primary personalities or figures in this story. So after Joseph is rejected... We'll use that word. And then sent away, by the way, to get a kingdom. Judah begins to descend figuratively and literally. Genesis chapter 38, verse 1 and 2. And it came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and visited a certain Adulamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he married her and went into her. So I said that Judah, after Joseph has been rejected, Judah begins to descend. And the word that is used for he departed from his brothers that were departed literally means descend. He descended from his brothers. There are some commentators that suggest that Jacob was really suspicious about this whole thing and that Judah actually was deposed. 
which is why, according to these commentators, he went to his friend, the Adulamite. And then, of course, he marries this Canaanite woman. And by this particular woman, he had three sons. So, <clears throat> a sidebar conversation here. Abraham didn't want Isaac to marry any of the daughters of the land, right? Isaac didn't want Jacob to marry any daughters of the land, right? We would suppose that Jacob didn't want his sons marrying any daughters of the land. And yet Judah, whose name means praise, what does he do? He takes a wife from among the Canaanites. And so he's kind of acting like Esau a little bit. And so considering how important it was to Abraham's family not to do this, why this particular lapse in judgment? By the way, the place that's mentioned in the Torah portion where at least his third son was born, the name of the place is Chesib or Chesib. That means to be deluded, delusion, to believe in something that's false. So either that's just kind of a coincidental thing that one of his sons happened to be born in this place, or maybe the scripture is trying to tell us something. That people start descending when they become deluded, when they start believing in something that is not true. So my question as I'm going through this is wondering, all right, so did um, choosing the Canaanite woman to marry, is that what caused him to be deluded? Or had this begun prior to all of these things? Maybe, maybe even prior to the incident with Joseph. Anyway, it says that Judah selected a wife for his firstborn son, and her name was Tamar. And as this story develops, um, I'm going to leave the details out. Mom, Dad, you can share the details with your children and grandchildren the way that you see fit. But the point is this. His son died, and so he said to his second son, you need to marry her and raise children for your, your brother. And it describes how this particular son responded to that particular challenge. And in the end, both of them are dead. God got rid of them. So Judah tells her, go back to your father's house, stay there, and when my third son gets old enough to marry you, I'll send him to you. But then she is forgotten. She's got to put over into place, and she's just kind of forgotten, which, by the way, is another theme that is in this Torah portion, being forgotten. Because Joseph interprets the dream of the cupbearer who is released to go back to Pharaoh's house, and he says, remember me before Pharaoh, but what does the cupbearer do? He forgets them. And so even though this isn't my main focus today, I do want to say this. It is one thing to be forgotten by men, but God doesn't forget. He doesn't forget your faithfulness. He doesn't forget the fact that you have shown goodness to others and that you've shown kindness to others and you've tried to do the right thing. People forget that. People have the attitude, what have you done for me lately? Right? But that is not the Father's way. The Father remembers these things. And in time, He brings about a reward regardless of our circumstances. It's interesting that Tamar's name means date palm. All right, so what does that got to do with anything? The root word signifies rising to great heights. So a date palm is a pretty tall tree. And Israel is full of these trees. And they, they, they get pretty tall. So the idea is rising to heights. And so the inference would be you have to come up. So you've been lowly, and now you're rising to great heights, which seems appropriate for this particular woman, considering that she is going to be the ancestor of the kings of Israel and even the Messiah himself. My point is that God does not forget what we've gone through. God does not forget what we have to endure, nor does he forget how we react to these things. And the point I'm trying to make here is that we are, when we are faithful in spite of things, when we are um, steadfast in spite of our circumstances, yes, men forget. Men don't care. But the Father does. And he, t he takes note of these things. So I felt that maybe somebody needed to hear that today. Now, some of the commentators believe that Judah did not want his third son to marry Tamar because he was kind of thinking that this woman's a black widow. You know, and that's my terminology, that it, I've given her two sons and they're both dead. 
I don't know if I want to have, turn my third son over to her. He'll end up dead too. And so if he thinks that way, we don't know for sure, but if he thought that way, he's like, no, I'm just, don't, we're going to forget about tomorrow over there. Or maybe it's because he wants him to grow up and mature, truly mature, so that you don't do the same stupid stuff that your brothers did. Maybe that's his reasoning. But whatever the reason was, he didn't fulfill his promise to her. He forgot about her. And so let's consider what has happened to Judah up until this point. He has lost two sons, and he's had to experience the grief that he caused his father. Furthermore, his sons were obviously spiritually inferior to Joseph. And I point that out for this reason. I can't think, I can't hardly believe that it didn't dawn on him just how spiritually debased these sons were. And then to think of what he was responsible, responsible for or complicit in at the very least when it came to Joseph. So that's just something to keep in mind as we go through this story. What is going on in his mind at this point in time? He's experienced the same grief that he caused his father to experience. It's almost like maybe, maybe, maybe God was trying to talk to him. As we go on in the story, we are reminded that the Scripture does not skirt around the bad behavior of God's people. It kind of puts it out there and sometimes in very graphic ways for us to see, yeah, these people are just like us. They think the way we do, they act the way we do at times, and they fall into some of the th same things that we do at times. Again, brothers betraying their own flesh and blood. First, they have thoughts of murder. No, we won't murder him. We don't want to do that. He is our flesh and blood. We'll just sell him to Ishmaelites, never hear from him again. And even though he's crying and pleading with them not to do this, they ignore all of that. Then on top of that, they cause their aged father grief, who says, I will go into my grave grieving the loss of my son. And now Judah, his wife is deceased at this point in time. And so he's going about and he sees a woman that he perceives to be a harlot and he goes into her and he impregnates her. But she, being rather shrewd herself, obtains his signet, his cord, and his staff as a pledge as a pledge that you're going to uh, compensate. And then she disappears and leaves Judah in a very awkward situation. In fact, he tells his friend, just leave it alone. You know, this is going to make me look bad. Just let her keep it, and we'll just go on about our business. Then a few months later, he hears that his daughter-in-law is pregnant. And what's his first response? Kill her. Get rid of her. It's a very rashly he responds to her what he believes to be indiscretion and is ready to just get rid of her and of course you know how she responds to that very calmly I would uh, add she very calmly just brings that those belongings that are his and says who do these belong to whoever owns these is the guy that got me pregnant and so he was asked a question with pretty much the same words that were posed to his father Jacob in regard to Joseph's blood-soaked tunic. So then, could he have been oblivious to the irony here? Or maybe, just maybe, God was speaking to him. God was trying to get his attention. There is this concept in Scripture, it's measure for measure, the judgment that you use against others, that's what's coming back at you. That's why you need to be careful how you judge. Now, if you want to be judged righteously, then judge righteously. But if you want to be rash, you want to be impulsive, and you just want to say somebody's guilty of something before you know all the facts, then get ready because that's coming back at you. That's the way it works. If you don't want to show mercy, guess what? You won't be shown mercy. If you don't forgive, guess what? you won't be forgiven. But on the flip side of that, if you want to, to reap mercy, sow mercy. And if you really, really want God to be merciful to you, then really, really be merciful to others. That's the way it works, measure for measure. And so there's no doubt in my mind that God's speaking to this guy. 
It doesn't say in the text, and God decided to do this in order to talk to Judah. But if these things were happening to you, and you knew what you had done, wouldn't it say something to you? Wouldn't you be going, I think somebody's trying to get my attention. So perhaps the irony was not lost on Judah. And then that is what kind of provoked him to confess about Tamar that she, the woman who has resorted to unspeakable things, is more righteous than I am. In other words, he kind of had to make a confession and realize and acknowledge just kind of the, the man I am right now and what I am guilty of. So then, I have to wonder if at this point in time, the seeds of repentance aren't being sown. There's still things he's going to have to do. There, he's going to have to bow himself before his brother Joseph. He's going to have to acknowledge his sin against his brother. He's going to have to be willing to be nothing and put himself in the place of another brother and perhaps be slave to this man for life. He's going to have to do some other things before the restoration is complete. But what I'm saying here is perhaps at this point in time, God is getting through to him and is already planting seeds of repentance, dealing with his heart. So let's contrast the, the, the difference in Joseph and Judah. Judah's failure compared with Joseph's virtue. Both in, in this Torah portion, both are tempted by women. One of them has got an agenda. The other one, she's just like, Joseph, come here. Both are tempted. Joseph did not give in to the temptation. Judah did. Joseph is descending into Egypt, but even there he's going to be considered a ruler and a leader because everywhere he went, God favored him, and he was ruling over the prison house. He was ruling over Potiphar's house, and eventually he ruled Pharaoh's house. But Judah's descent was something else. And it was problematic. And it was troublesome. But even then, there is a promise of redemption. So, with all the attention that we tend to give Joseph in this Torah portion and in the next one, and, it, and rightfully so, but in giving Joseph all that attention, it's really easy to kind of overlook what God is dealing with Judah about and what he's saying through the life of Judah. And maybe, maybe that's why right in the middle of all the things that are happening to Joseph, the scripture interrupts and says, but I want you to look at what happened to Judah. I want you to pay attention to this for just a moment. Because what I see in that, God is reminding us that, yes, I'm dealing with Joseph and I'm working things out for Joseph to fulfill my purpose for him. But at the same time, I'm dealing with Judah and working out things for him so that he can fulfill my purpose for his life as well. And that leads us, as I said, these parallel paths will converge in the Messiah. It leads us to the Messiah and the promised redemption. In fact, both of these notable men, as I've already pointed out, have connections to the Messiah because the Messiah is, in fact, the summation and the emphasis of both of their stories because Messiah is the one who is going to reunite and unite them as one family and in a time of trouble. So here's my point. We learn that God redeems his people and he delivers them from their enemy, including their most antagonistic enemy. And that's not Pharaoh. It's not Potiphar. It's not Pelosi. started with a P. I had to go with it. <laughs> Our greatest adversary is self. And so not only do we have to be delivered from the Potiphar's and the Pharaoh's and the prisons and yes, the Pelosi's and the, to start running a string of names here, but we're not going to overcome those adversaries until we learn to come over, overcome the one that dwells within us. So, you know, Joseph... It's easy to see how God used him. He's virtuous. He's spiritually discerning. He's a great kid, you know? It's easy to see how God used him. It's easy to see how God rewarded him and he delivered him. But I want you to consider this. God didn't forget about Judah. He didn't discard him in spite of everything that Judah had done. You remember how Peter told Messiah on the eve of the crucifixion, if everybody deserts you, not me, I will die for you. And what happened? 
he forgot that he even knew this guy. I don't even know the man. And for most of us, that would be enough to say, I'm done with you. But that's not the way with Yeshua, is it? He comes back to him and said, and I'm going to paraphrase, three times you said you didn't know me. Now I'm going to ask you three times, do you? And do you love me? And Peter, you said you would lay down your life for me. I'm going to give you another chance to demonstrate whether or not you really meant that. He doesn't forget, and he doesn't discard. And so if it was true with Judah, if it was true with Peter, then it's true with you and me. He does not forget about us in whatever the circumstance we find ourselves. If we're like Joseph, or we think we're like Joseph, and it's really easy for us to identify with Joseph because I've been betrayed, I've been humiliated, I've been discarded, I've been oppressed, right? Right? So it's really easy to identify with that. Well, if that is us, guess what? He remembers. He doesn't forget. We may have to go through some very difficult situations, but he doesn't forget, and he delivers. But let's flip it over. Is it possible that there have been times in our life when we could identify with Judah? In other words, not being betrayed, but betraying. Not being oppressed, but oppressing. Not being humiliated, but being the one who humiliates and discards somebody else. Now, nobody wants to own up to that. And yet, I guarantee you, if we look long and hard enough back through our life, we might be able to find instances where we could, in truth, identify with that. Even so, there is hope of redemption. Even so, there's hope of redemption for all of those kinds of people when their hearts are prone to repent. Come, let us return unto the Lord. Amen? Here's why. Romans chapter 11, verse 29 says, in speaking about Israel and their calling and the gifts that God has given them, the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. He doesn't change his mind. Just because we're stupid sometimes... And sometimes we don't use our talents and gifts for the reason he gave them to us. We go and use them for other reasons. I'll tell you a little story. And to, I'm going to tell you this story because to me it's a tragedy. And I don't know how many of you listened to Elvis growing up. But, you know, in my household growing up, you know, we listened to Southern Gospel. And not by choice. Not by my choice. We listened to Southern Gospel. That's what we were allowed to hear. We were allowed to hear what my dad called hillbilly music, which is Hank Williams, Ernest Tubb, Jimmy Rogers, and, you know, Blue Yodel number nine. <laughs> and stuff like Elvis and Buddy Holly, all right? So anyway, here's the story. Right before Elvis signed a contract to sing all the things that he sung, he was trying very hard to sing in a gospel quartet because it was his dream to sing gospel music. He loved gospel music. And about the time of this, um, this group, it was the Blackwood Brothers, I believe, were going to sign him up to sing in their quartet. He said, I can't do it. And they said he started to cry. He said, well, I just signed a contract to sing rhythm and blues. Here's my point. God gives us talents and gifts to use for his purposes. And it is possible to misappropriate those gifts and talents. It is possible for us to use them for other things, whatever they are. But just because we misuse them and misappropriate them does not mean he takes them away from us. And here's why. Because there's always the hope of redemption. There's always the hope that we're going to say, come, let us return unto the Lord. My way didn't work. His way is the only way. And so as long as there is breath in our lungs, there is a hope in redemption. And there is a hope that those gifts and those talents and those skills that he's given us can be used for the reason he gave them to us. Did that make any sense to you? You understand what I'm trying to say here? So then the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. So there is always hope of redemption. Now, I want you to see this concept revealed even in the midst of Judah's descent. And it's in Genesis chapter 38, beginning at verse 27. 
Now it came to pass at the time for giving birth that, behold, this is talking about Tamar, at the time for giving birth that, behold, twins were in her womb. And so it was when she was giving birth that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand, saying, This one came out first. Then it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpectedly, and she said, How did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore his name was called Peretz. Afterward his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. So first of all, notice that twins obviously run in Abraham's family. And this is the at least second occasion where we see that twins growing inside the womb are struggling with one another. Because this happened when Rebekah was pregnant with Jacob and Esau. And so there, there seems, once again, to be this struggle about who's going to be born first. And now, technically speaking, the firstborn in this case was Zerah, who, by the way, his name means light or shining. So that's the idea behind his name. But we also see that the firstborn of the flesh isn't always the firstborn according to God. Cain and Abel... Who is righteous? Who is son of the wicked one? Ishmael and Isaac. Paul tells us very plainly, Ishmael's the son of the flesh. Isaac is the son of promise. Esau, Jacob. Jacob I have loved. Esau I have rejected. And now Reuben and Joseph. Reuben was the firstborn, but he defiled his father's bed. And so Jacob give the birthright to Joseph. So we have all these different instances where man looks at the firstborn of the flesh. That's the firstborn. That's the one we've got to keep an eye on. Not so, not necessarily so, when God. In fact, more often than not, it's the second guy you've got to keep your eye on. So in this particular case, Zara sticks his hand out. She ties a scarlet thread around. His hand comes back in, and out comes Peretz. And so his name means to break forth. So in this, we see that things don't always happen the way we would expect they would happen. If that baby's hand's coming out, you're, I'm figuring the other parts are going to follow. But it didn't work out that way. And it doesn't happen all the time the way we expect it to happen. But everything happens according to the Father's plan. Sometimes... His plan incorporates our mistakes. Would you agree? Sometimes his plan incorporates our mistakes. Sometimes his plan doesn't always give us what we deserve. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That was my point. Give thanks with a grateful heart, right? Sometimes we don't always get what we deserve because with him there's always hope. There's always the hope of redemption. So the situation with Tamar, for instance, it didn't have to happen the way it did. Probably shouldn't have happened the way it did. Nevertheless, God brings forth his plan in spite of circumstances, in spite of the consequences of our choice. I don't think, and this is my belief, Ishmael wasn't supposed to happen because Abraham wasn't supposed to go down to Egypt and tell everybody Sarah's my sister. That's what I believe. And that is why we have Ishmael. That's why we're still dealing with Ishmael. And if there's no Ishmael, who are the brothers going to sell Joseph to? Okay? But my point is that even in those kinds of situations... When there are consequences of our choices, God's purpose and plan can still go forward. And he incorporates those things into his purpose at times. So when these two boys are emerging from the womb and the second one comes after the first one made a, a very brief appearance, she said, how did you break through? And that term is paratza. Do we have the Hebrew to show them? There we go. Paratza. Paratza, to break through. And then she says, this breach, and that next word is paratz, 
this breach be upon you. Therefore, his name was called Peretz. And so his name Peretz means he's breaking through. He's breaking out. So there was this unexpected breakthrough that occurred here. And what I want you to see is this is in the midst of Judah's descent. This is when he is continually making bad choices. And throughout this process, it seems to me anyway, that God is very subtly, sometimes very dramatically, saying something to him, speaking to him, reminding him of things. As we prayed this morning over our children and our grandchildren, those who are here and those who are not here, that if need be, God would make their lives miserable until they return to him and to his truth. We pray that for our children, that he would make their lives miserable. But what we're trying to say here is you keep reminding them of their bad choices and the consequences of their bad choices and keep reminding them that it doesn't have to be this way. That there's always this path that leads back to their heavenly father's house. And yes, to their parents' house too, but most importantly to his house. And so there are these things that have been happening to Judah. And in the midst of all this, there is a very unexpected breakthrough. That's what I want you to see. There's this unexpected breakthrough, and it's one that has very large ramifications. Because by the first century, that is Yeshua's time, the time when he was walking the earth, this name Peretz was not just a name. It was a title. And it was a title that identified the Mashiach, identified the Messiah. Just like Ben David or Son of David is a title for the Messiah. Peretz is a title for the Messiah. His unexpected appearance in rabbinical literature is connected to the prophecy in Isaiah where it says a son is given. And this unexpected appearance of this boy Peretz is connected to the prophet Malachi's uh, mention of the fact that the king you seek will suddenly appear. Because there are things that God does when his purposes come to pass, they appear unexpectedly many times, or they happen very suddenly. Peretz is highlighted in the book of Ruth, which is a very prophetic book, which ba basically is you've got this Jewish guy and this Jewish woman who's lost her inheritance, and she has this Gentile daughter-in-law who joins herself to her mother-in-law. They return to the land of her nativity, and the Jewish guy marries the Gentile woman, and through this union, the kingdom of Israel is established. And so it's a very prophetic book. Well, in that book, in Ruth chapter 4, it, when they find out that Ruth is pregnant, they said, may your house be like Peretz. May it be like the man Peretz who was born to Judah because of the offspring that God's going to give you. In verse 18, it talks about the generations of Peretz in the book of Ruth. But what it's really getting to is this, the birth of David. And so, again, David or son of David is a title for the Messiah. Peretz, to break through, is something that is associated with the Messiah as well. And so the coming of the Messiah is related to this idea of breaking through breaking out, things that happen very unexpectedly. And the thing that you've been longing for, the thing that you've been seeking, ultimately the Messiah will appear suddenly. How does he describe his return? He puts it this way, stay on guard, be watchful. You don't know when it's going to happen, but when it happens, it's going to happen fast, and you've got to be ready. You get me? So this idea of something breaking through very unexpectedly. So he is related to this Poretz, and that is related in turn to the kingdom of heaven at large. To this day, the, the kingdom, Israel, is a divided kingdom, is it not? That wasn't a trick question. This is the burning question on the minds of the disciples in Acts chapter 1. Will you at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? What did he say? Father's got that all under control. Don't worry about the timing of that. He's got that all under control. I need you to do your job. 
But what is the inference there? It will happen. It's going to happen at the very time he has ordained it would happen. And when it happens, it's going to happen fast. It's going to break through. And so the kingdom of heaven, and you've heard me share this before, is designed to break out, to break through, to go forward, to advance. And so that only makes sense if the kingdom is to break out, to break through. It only makes sense that those who are part of the kingdom will experience this in their lives as well. There are things that we have been contending for, hoping for, reaching for, praying for, fasting for long, 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 long time. Right? There comes a time, if we will continue to be faithful, and even when we have been unfaithful like Judah has at times, if we allow God to speak to us and touch our hearts and to have broken and contrite hearts and repentant hearts and ones that want to conform to his will, even then we can experience this breakthrough. I want to go to Micah chapter 2 just to kind of underscore all of this. And it's a prophecy that just basically tells us that it is the Messiah who is going to restore the kingdom. He's going to put everything back together. And when he does, there is going to be this unexpected breakthrough. Micah chapter 2, verse 12. I will surely assemble all of you, O Jacob. I will surely gather the remnant of Israel, and I will put them together like sheep of the fold, like a flock in the midst of their pasture. They shall make a loud noise because of so many people. And the one who breaks, and that is haporetz, poretz, the one who breaks open will come up before them. They will break out partsu, that's came, it came, uh, comes from the same root word. They will break out and pass through the gate and go out by it. Their king will pass before them with the Lord at their head. So, First of all, this is a prophecy that Yeshua alludes to in Matthew chapter 11 when he's talking about John the Baptist, and he's talking about how, uh, you know, what did you go out to see? Did you go see this, this, this? But if you went to see a prophet, then you found him. And he goes on to say, but from the time of John the Baptist until now, the time he was speaking, the kingdom of heaven, King James, suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. But what he was really saying there was, from the time that John the Baptist came on the scene until now, that time Yeshua was speaking to them, the kingdom of heaven has been breaking out. It's been breaking out, and people are beginning to recognize that something's happening or something's getting ready to happen, and they're ready to break out with it. That's what he was saying, that something those who were spiritually discerning would understand that something is getting ready to happen. It may not happen when we're expecting it, and we might little see a sign that we think, oh, that's it. And then that sign disappears. For instance, do you know how many red heifers there have been in Israel that people said, this means they're going to build the temple next week? If you've kept up with any of that through the years, you know that happens a lot. And how many decades have we been identifying the Antichrist? <laughs> Hitler was the Antichrist, wasn't he? Well, he was an Antichrist, but he wasn't the Antichrist. Some people thought that Anwar Sadat was the Antichrist. I don't want to mention any names, Barry, but anyway. Um, <laughs> some people thought that Juan Carlos was the Antichrist. I bet you most of you don't even remember who Juan Carlos was. But he was the Antichrist. Mikhail Gorbachev. He was the Antichrist. And then there were some people who said that Ronald Reagan was the Antichrist. And then it was Obama. He was the Antichrist. Or, you know, and on and on and on and on and on. So we'll see these little things and we think, oh, this is it. And then it disappears. And then God breaks through with something that we didn't expect. But when he does, the spiritually discerning will recognize what he's doing, and as it's happening, they'll get on board and they'll break out with it. So, where was I? He does this 
in the midst of Judah's descent. That's what I'm really wanting to get across to, to someone today. That even though we make and have made bad choices and are having to deal with the consequences of those bad choices, if our hearts can be touched, if he can get through to our heart and prick it and, and, and us receive what he has to say and be, become broken and contrite and repentant, even in the midst of those stupid choices we made and the consequences we're having to pay for those choices, nevertheless, there can be a breakthrough. And that breakthrough has ties to redemption. It has ties to restoration. So if you think about it, when Messiah is coming on the scene, and in Matthew 11, he's saying these things about John the Baptist and about, well, really, by implying that John the Baptist was the breaker, he was implying that he, Yeshua, was the king, according to the prophecy in Micah 2. And so if you think about the timing of all this, Judah at that time was in descent. They were oppressed. The kingdom was stagnant, at least up until the time that John the Baptist comes on the scene. A lot of them were in unbelief. In fact, that's why John came preaching repentance. That was his message. Repent. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Make the crooked path straight. Prepare the way of the Lord. He doesn't say that to people who've got it all together. He says it to a people who are in descent because he is regarded as haporetz. He's regarded as the breaker. In fact, the, the sage Rashi said that the breaker, according to the prophecy in Micah 2, is the one who breaks the fences of thorns and the hedges of briars to straighten the road before them. So rabbinic sages understand this prophecy to be speaking of someone who breaks through so that God's people and God's kingdom can serve its purpose. And so those thorns, those hedges, those briars, why do we have to break through those things? Because those are the consequences of the choice that Adam made. I thought so. <laughs> those are the consequences of the choice that Adam and all the sons of Adam since then make. We reject the tree of life. We go to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We eat these things that we're not supposed to eat. We ingest these philosophies and ideologies that we're not supposed to. We make choices, and then we end up with the briars and the thorns and the thistles and all of the hedges that keep us or try to keep us pinned in. But when we are of a broken and contrite heart, repentant heart, we are empowered to break through that stuff. We don't have to cohabitate with the tares. <laughs> we can break through those things. So then, what I'm trying to say is that even if we are having to deal with the consequences of our choices, a breakthrough is still possible. It's just going to depend on the condition of our heart. The adversary is not going to just lay down and play dead. He's going to fight. He's going to oppose. He's going to contend. He's going to strive. He's going to accuse. He's going to do everything he can to try to stop God's purposes. But in spite of that, if God has a people who are discerning what he's saying, hearing his voice, following him with their heart, God's purpose is going to break out. And so, you know, all the Potiphar's and the Pharaoh's and the Pelosi's and all of the, you know, the different people that we can think of and the different entities, maybe that's the right word, that have and still today stand in opposition to God's purposes. And in some cases have provoked us to make certain choices that didn't or aren't turning out so good. In spite of that, there can be a breakthrough. So, again, if we believe that God has purposed to do this for the sake of his people as a nation, then I believe that he has purposed to do it for the sake of just one. We say here many times that we're only going to be as strong a fellowship as our weakest 
component, right? The weakest among us is going to affect all of us in some way, and vice versa, the strongest and the stronger can have positive impact. But you understand what I'm trying to say. When the, when the enemy comes against us, he's not going to come against us where we're the strongest. He's going to come against us where we are the weakest. And he's going to reconnoiter, and he's going to investigate, and he's going to probe our lines, so to speak, to determine where is the weak point. That's where he's going to attack. And that's why, I mean, we're only as strong as our weakest component. So then, as an assembly, it behooves us not to ignore our weaknesses, not to glorify them and aggrandize them, but to pay attention to them so that we can offset those weaknesses, so that we can reinforce those weaknesses, so that if there is a weak point in the line, we have some of the stronger who go and reinforce that weak point until that place gets built up. So that makes sense to me in the context of an assembly. So if it works for an assembly or it applies to an assembly, shouldn't it apply to the nation at large? In other words, his people are only going to be as strong as the weakest among them. And so if he is willing to, for the sake of the nation, cause his purposes to break out and to break through, would he not also be willing to bring that about for the one? And so then... We believe that God has purposed to do that. If you have been betrayed, if you have been falsely accused, if you've been mistreated, if you have been oppressed like Joseph, hang on. Because one day the call will come if we remain faithful. But also for the one who has betrayed, the one who has accused, the one who has mistreated and oppressed others, if you have a heart to hear what God is saying, and to respond with repentance and brokenness, there is hope of a breakthrough there as well. There is hope of redemption there. Because where there is faithfulness and a heart to change toward God, there's always going to be hope. So I believe, I'm saying this for myself, and I know it's going to apply to others, I believe that many of us are in need of such a breakthrough. So if that is the case, then we must do our part. And when we do our part, we believe that he will do his part. It's not written in the text. And so you'll have to take this for what it's worth. But there's just something in my heart and spirit that tells me when I'm reading all these things about Judah, that these things that are happening to him are having an impact. The wheels are turning. There's something going on inside it internally. And, and what convinces me of that is when we get to the end of this story where these two are estranged, it's Judah who's going to step forward and say to this man that he still doesn't recognize just yet, I need to tell you a story. And this story is going to implicate me in some pretty nefarious dealings. And it's not going to paint me in the most positive of light. It's going to make me look pretty bad. But I've had a heart change. Did it start then? Or has it already started? And was that child that, that broke through, was there some little subtle message to Judah? I can break through in your life. Are you hearing what I'm saying here? I know that terms like breakthrough, oh, that sounds so churchy. Get over it. <laughs> it's a biblical term. It's a Hebraic concept. That's what the kingdom of heaven is designed to do. Breakthrough, break out. And all of the things that have kept us hemmed in, whether it's bad relationships, our past ties to things that, that we shouldn't be tied to. I, I, you know, I, I hinted a little bit about, you know, where I come from. And I, I don't say this with any disrespect to any of my ancestors, but I come from some pretty ugly stuff. Ugly, ugly stuff. 
disgusting in some cases. And that's where I come from. And I have, you know, at times wondered, what, if anything, has that to do with the struggles that I have sometimes had to, in, to deal with and engage? And, and I don't, you know, I don't want to get into all those kinds of things, you know, too much. It's just to say that in my life, I've had to go to the Father and say, I need to break through this. I need to break out of this. I don't need this to be, you know, keeping me hemmed up all the time. And he's, he's brought those things to pass in my life, and he's, and he's still doing that. And I believe that he's going to continue to do that if I'll do my part. And that's what I'm trying to say. We, many of us, need a breakthrough in some area. We are believing God for that. Because when the weakest of us breaks through, and now the weak say, I am strong. And the poor say, I am rich. It's not just going to benefit the one. It's going to benefit the entire assembly. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. And again, I ask you that you will breathe on that word, that message that is meant for your people today. That that you wish to impart to them, that that is what you would breathe upon. That is what you would cause to come alive in our spirit and our heart and, and our being. And to reveal to us those things that you want to reveal to us those things that need to be overcome, those things that need to be abandoned, those things that need to be uh, striven for, those things that we need to uh, ascribe to and attain. Reveal those things to us, Father. And I do pray for those who are here, those who are watching on the live stream, that, that we'd, we would be able to break through any hedge, any um, wall, any impediment that has kept us bound up and penned in, kept us restrained. I pray, Father, that by your spirit and by your word, today we will be able to break out, that tomorrow we will be able to break out. In the weeks ahead, we will continue to break forth that your purpose and your kingdom can be established in this community, in this world. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to continually overcome this adversary that lurks within us, that we truly could be conformed to the image of the Son of God who has told us he has overcome the world. Therefore, we also in him can overcome this world and everything about it. We are believing for that. And so, Father, we just commit this to you and to your spirit to do what you will with it. We pray, Father, that you would continue to bless and prosper and protect your people. In Yeshua's name, amen. amen. I'm always excited when the Holy Spirit does what seems to happen so often, and that is he'll say something that I know the Father has put in his heart to say, which is almost verbatim, something that he excited with me with you know, before we got here. And Bill and I haven't compared notes. And it's, it's like, he said, okay, just so you know, I'm in the midst of this. Here's this little paragraph. I'm going to tell you, and I'm going to tell you the exact same thing. And so it's so exciting. So, of course, I'm telling you that because it happened again today. Um, I was thinking on the tour portion, and I'm reading, and I'm just, I don't know why I didn't think of it this way before, but I'm thinking about the brothers and what they did to Joseph. I mean, not that I'm just realizing how horrible that was. I already knew that. But what impacted me so that I guess I just never thought of it in the depths the way I did this time is that exactly what he said. Look at the horrible things these brothers did. Look at 
Joseph's immaturity, perhaps, yes, the ignorance of his youth. Um, he was the baby. He probably was um, told, well, he never would have let us get away with that. You know, we've all been in that situation. If you're one of the younger in the family, I know my brothers told me that throughout my life. But um, I'm just thinking about these weren't little, you know, he broke my toy offenses. This was some pretty major stuff that spoke to the condition of the heart and the seeds of bitterness they had allowed to grow in them. And I'm thinking of all these things and then the things that he's speaking on today. You know, they're also part of that story. But look, we're talking about them today. We're learning from them today. The Father used them anyway. I wouldn't say that no matter what they did, because it mattered. It matters to us today. It's a lesson for us today not to do those same things. They all have terrible consequences, and these boys all suffered those. Um, but the fact that we, his children, can do the things that we have done, the things that Joseph and his brothers did, and still be used by the king. I mean, it makes me want to fall to my knees right now because of his mercy. We don't deserve it. I know me, and I know I don't deserve it. And I don't know all of you as well as I know some of you, but I'll just go ahead and make a blanket statement. You don't deserve it either. There's not one of us here who does. But look at how merciful he is. And so I'm just thinking of that today. And then when he gets up here and he's saying the same thing, I'm like, oh, my goodness. Yes, Father, I am listening. So there's obviously every time we read the Torah portion, we should gain some new nugget out of it. There should be some realization that didn't impact us as strongly before. And I guess that was mine this time. And if that's not happening to you, pray for it. It is exciting. When he does that, it is exciting. So if you're not experiencing that, ask him to do it for you. He will. I'm just so thankful for his mercy. Um, another point that I just want to speak to very quickly, um, what Bill had brought forth. Considering that many of us just got together with family or loved ones or dear friends, um, I hope that everybody here was able to get together with somebody that um, you appreciate and love, or maybe somebody you don't appreciate and uh, have a good Thanksgiving. Work on some things. Think of your own family. Are you the one who forgets your brother or sister? Yeah, think about that. That's, that's kind of heavy. Are you the one who is forgotten? Maybe you're neither. Maybe it doesn't happen in your family. But in either case, it's important to remember that Abba does not forget his children. So when you're feeling the pain of being forgotten, pray for those that you feel have forgotten you. Don't get a bad attitude and wish hateful things on them. That's not going to benefit you. It's not going to help them. Nobody's going to win in that situation. So pray for them. Being forgotten doesn't mean that you're weak. It doesn't mean that you don't have a purpose. It doesn't mean that you can't be used. It doesn't mean you've done too much that the Father can't use you. Again, look at Joseph's brothers and all they did, and they were still used. Being forgotten could just mean that you're being used to provoke growth in the forgetters. So... Don't have a pity party. Let's not get stuck there. Yeah, we've all been the last one chosen for, I don't know, a sports game or something. Or the one left out of the invitation for the party. Or the one not invited to go to ice cream that particular time. Or whatever the case may be. You know, choose whatever it is. Whatever that thing is that you would like to have gone to and you didn't get the message. Or maybe it was a group meeting for a different reason and it just wasn't your time or the Father's purpose for you to go right then, and you get your feelings hurt. It's happened to me. I dare say there's probably not a person in here who hasn't felt that one time or the other. Don't have a pity party. 
because he may have a plan in that. And he doesn't forget you, and he doesn't forget what happens to you at the hands of other people. He will bring about the consequences that they need, not for, I'll show them, but for growth for them, because that's what he's about. He's about all of us growing, all of us doing better, all of us being better, all of us treating each other better. So if we're so busy listening to that little voice inside of us saying, I'm the victim. People just need to coddle me. They just don't understand what I've been through. Nobody else on the planet has dealt with this. No, wrong. Pray for the person and pray for yourself to get out of the little pity party at the same time. I've had them. I know what they're like. I've attended my own pity party. Believe me. I was the only person there most of the time. So just get out of it. <laughs> it's a lonely place to be, and you help isolate yourself. And the enemy just loves that. And then you're not helping the other person. You're not helping yourself. So I think there's so much in this. Um, whether you're the forgetter or the forgotten. I think we've all been both. But let's be the exception. Let's truly be the exception. Examine your life and ask. Like I said, we've all just been together for Thanksgiving. Maybe there was that person there you'd rather they forgot where you lived and didn't show up for that wonderful dinner. Um, maybe you're the person that was forgotten. In either case, let's be the exception and not forget our brother and sister. Let's live in such a way that if you are the forgotten, he can raise you up. He didn't forget his plan for you. If you've strayed away from the purpose for which he created you, doesn't mean that you're getting away from it because, oh, he forgot. It's been so long since this guy's been on the path he was supposed to that, oh, the father just forgot. No, wrong. He doesn't forget. And he gives your loved ones promises when they pray for you that he will bring you back. So if that's you or one of you out there, he hasn't forgotten you, and he will bring you back because of promises that he has made. Don't forget the promise. So don't be a forgetter, not just your brother or sister, but of his promise. So I'll stop there because there, there's, I mean, well, so many, I don't know how he does choose what to speak about because there are so many things, so many trails you could go down, paths you could take in the scriptures, so many just golden nuggets that you can bring out. Um, but I'm thankful for what he does because I do always learn something new. And um, if I have been the forgetter, which, as I said before, I have in times past, I have. Uh, and forgetting doesn't mean just, oh, I didn't remember that person existed. To me, it can mean you forget about somebody else's feelings. Or maybe you didn't forget about them, but you just cared about yours more. Um, there was a young man when I was in junior high school. And, you know, kids can be so cruel, just horrible to each other. I mean, adults can too. But in high school world, there was a young man who was kind of the butt of everybody's joke. And he played in the band, and he and I got along pretty good. He... He was about a year younger than I was. And I didn't like how he was treated by the other kids, but I was kind of shy, and I didn't often speak up. And there was one day where some of the guys did something mean to him, and I knew it was wrong what they did to him, but instead of speaking up and saying, y'all should be ashamed of yourselves, because I was kind of afraid of these boys, I laughed. And I've never forgotten that because I know that was hurtful to that young man and I feel like I betrayed him. And in that moment, I forgot to consider my neighbor as myself because if that had been me in that situation, I would have wanted somebody to stand up for me. I would have wanted somebody to remember I have feelings too. So I think we should repent for those times that we've been that person that I described just now, who, what I did, um, and 
Ask the Father how to help you make it right. And again, if you're the one who's forgotten, just wait, your time is coming. So I'll move on, like I said a minute ago. Uh, prayer requests. Matt and Alice Morris in Oregon, um, I'd like for you to hold them up in prayer. I'm not going to go into details because they didn't ask if I could. But just know that they have been dramatically affected by impositions of the day. And it has very much changed their life for now. But I want you to pray that the Father will encourage them to know that this is not a permanent situation. He has not forgotten. He sees their heart and that this is for a season. And though it may be uncomfortable right now, he has something even better for them. So if you will, lift up Matt and Alice. Abba has a better plan. Just don't lose heart, guys. Just don't lose heart. Your family is here praying for you. And that goes for anybody else who's in that same situation. I just happen to know of this one personally. Um, let's pray for Caden's grandmother. Um, Caden's going to be going to help his grandmother soon. Um, and so just pray for both of them. Um, I'm glad that he can go help. And just pray that there will be uh, time for precious memories made, for some wonderful bonding there. And um, just keep them both in prayer. And then um, Hilda Page sent in a request. Um, there's a family who's um, the husband and the wife and the wife's 86-year-old mother. They're all very sick with COVID. Um, this prayer request came in uh, day before yesterday, I believe. And I don't know anything since then. So I pray that things have improved. But let's pray for these people and for anyone else who finds himself in that same situation. Um, and I'll just stop right there for now. I want us to also, as we're praying for these individuals, let's just pray for our brothers and sisters in the body in this day and time to have resolve, yeah. to have courage, and to have confidence in our Father. Yeah. That nothing takes him by surprise. So I just think that we're all going to eventually, all of us are going to come into the valley of decision where some things are concerned. And so we are, are all going to have to have that resolve. We're all going to have to exhibit that courage, not in our abilities, but because it's in the confidence that he's going to see us through. Because it's everything that's going on that's affecting a few right now is going to affect all eventually. Okay? So let's just be praying for one another, to encourage one another to have, to have courage, mm -hmm. to have that resolve, to say, and you know, you know, we know that you're a king of kings, but we're still not going to bow down to your image, and we're not going to worship your gods, all right? It's one thing to say it. It's another thing to follow through. So we need to be praying for one another in that regard. All right, go ahead. Amen. And as you learn of these situations, truly, our hearts will be touched, and we'll, we'll want to help individually. Um, as you learn of situations, not everybody's going to know of the same one. Pray for wisdom and discernment in all of this, okay? All right, if you will, stand with us. And the situations that you know of, just bring them before the Father now, and let's thank Him that we can bring these things to Him and know that He is already working on it. Our Father and King, our Redeemer, our Savior, the one who never forgets. You don't ever slumber. You're always on watch for your children. We have no idea how blessed we are and how great your mercies are, Abba. But what we do know of, we thank you for. We are so grateful. Abba, these situations that we've brought to you now for, for the Morse family, I just thank you. I thank you that even in this difficult situation they're experiencing right now, that is an opportunity for growth. It's an opportunity to, to re-examine what is the most important thing and to be excited about what you 
as the Father are doing because you have a good plan. And when man thinks that they're interrupting that, you give us even better. And I thank you for that. Father, I pray for this grandmother and grandson. How sweet it is they get to spend some time together. And I just pray that it will be wonderful in every way and that you will just um, improve the health where it's, it's needed. Father, I don't know all the ailments of the grandmother, but I do know that you are able to heal. And in, in both of these, I just pray that you would bring about great healing. And Father, for this family who is dealing with illness, I just thank you that uh, your plan is perfect. And even though we don't, under, we don't always understand why things happen the way they do, Father, we know that if we're walking with you, we don't have to worry. Even though we do sometimes, we don't have to worry because you only have our best interest in mind. Father, there are so many situations that we know of, so many things going on, uh, so many ways the world thinks that they're winning and that we are forgotten. No, it's not true. And I thank you for that, my King. You are supreme. You will have your way. And I am so thankful that you allow us to be part of it, despite the ways we have behaved, despite how we have not considered our brother or sister, we've put ourselves first. Despite how sometimes we have walked away from your purpose for our life, there's nothing we can do that if we come to you and repent and beg for your forgiveness that you won't welcome us with open arms. Father, let the one, plurally, the ones who are holding back, who are still feeling they've been too hurt or they've done too much or just pride, whatever the reason, Father, break them through all of that and bring them to you. Restore them to your house. Make them realize that yes, restitution is important. It needs to happen. You don't have to go and sit before a panel of ridiculers for every sin you've done. All you have to do is take them to the king and say, I've been so wrong and you never left me. I'm the one who walked away. I lay it all before you now, knowing that you'll give me an opportunity to restore relationship where I need to. But I don't have to sit and be humiliated by a panel of scoffers for every little thing I've done or every big thing. Help them realize, Father, move on their hearts today We need them in this walk, and they need you in this walk. And we love them. Some of them are our own loved ones, Father. Some of them are people we've never met and never will meet, but you know them and you know everything about them, and they cannot hide. So we pray that this prayer reaches to the farthest places, to that one who thinks they're forgotten, or maybe would just love to be forgotten. No. Nope. You love too much for that. And so we will too. Regardless of the hurt that we have either given or we have received, your love is great enough to flood it all. And so I pray that you will do just that and that where yielding is needed, where pride needs to die, you'll cause it to happen. And you will bring your children home. Thank you for this, Abba, in Yeshua's precious name. Amen. At this time, we want to invite everyone who has prepared and has a willing heart to bring an offering before the Lord to thank Him for His goodness to us. 
and we want to invite everyone who's online. If you want to participate in this, we want you to do that at this time as well. if everyone would just remain standing and let's receive this blessing. like we're over here. Am I right, guys? Okay. Turn around and look at the red light in the corner. The rest of our family is there. We want to say Shabbat Shalom to you. We love you. We're so glad that you joined us today. And we remember we won't be having Midrash, so I won't be giving instructions. But I do want to see our first-time visitors. If you will, raise your hand on this side and the other. If this is your very first time here. Okay. We have a good handful. Yay. Well, normally we would invite you to go first in the line for Oneg, but since uh, everybody's... Oh, okay. Well, she was about to say we usually let them go first to Oneg, right? Today we'll let you be the first to go to the bathroom. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Very true. Yes, those are limited here, so we, uh, we have to be nice to each other and consider one who's dancing the most in line. So, anyway, yes. So raise your hands again, first time visitors. We want to be sure we see you first in line for that special room. <laughs> so family, you know, let's let them go first and take advantage of that because next week, 
no preference. You'll have to wait in line and just be the best dancer. So. Even though we're not going to do Oneg together, we still want to do Kiddush and Hamotzi together. And so again, I want to say Shabbat Shalom to everybody, everybody here, everyone who's at home watching on the live stream. Welcome to all of our guests. We're so glad that you're with us. Um, if you want to come back next week, we won't be here. We'll be across town. So everybody remember, next week we're at OCI slash ramp, whatever we're calling that building. But um, we'll be there next Friday night. So until then, everyone have a peaceful Shabbat. And I hope that everyone has a very nice afternoon that you get to rest and spend time with your family and your friends. And uh, I, for one, am going to go stare out my back door at the mountains and the trees and uh, resist the temptation to go pulling all that stuff out of the refrigerator, warming it up again. But uh, <laughs> I don't know where Allison's at. She's on the other side? Okay. All right. Join me. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Bovein peri hagafen Amen Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine, and forgiving us, Yeshua, the Messiah, who said, I am the vine, and you are the branches. L'chaim. Oh, wow. You're going to want some of this. Baruch Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Hamutzi lechem min haaretz Amen Blessed are you, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth, and for giving us Yeshua, the Messiah, who said, I am the bread of life. Amen. I want a piece. I want a piece of that bread. I need more juice now. I can't say it. <laughs> I don't know. It's still a big piece of bread. Anyway, forgive me. As you go, and don't go yet. Don't go yet. I need to tell you something just a minute. But as you go, the third door down the left, if you need prayer... Adian, come back as soon as you deliver that baby. Third door on the left, if you need prayer, there's some people that will be there to pray with you about whatever situation you may be facing. Because we don't want to dismiss and go home until we at least invite anyone who needs prayer to get that prayer and to remind us all, let's not take for granted our, our Father's mercy and His grace. But at the same time, let's not forget that that mercy and grace is there for us. And so before we leave, we want to know that our lives are as they should be where our Father is concerned and that we know our Messiah, that, and even more so that He knows us, that He knows us by name. And so if there's any doubt in anyone's mind or heart about that relationship today, right now, is the time to resolve that. And so here... If you want to pray with some folks in there, however you want to do it, we just want to remind everybody. It, it doesn't matter how much information we have attained and accumulated and how well we can articulate it. It's important that we know Him, that we have that relationship with Him, and that our sins have been forgiven. Amen? Amen. So God bless everybody at home. We'll see you Friday night. So I need everybody... Just hold your horses, and I need to know when we're offline. <laughs>